Hey guys, thanks so much for joining us on another episode of Calvary Conversations. My name is Mariah and I'm here with my big brother, Pastor Morgan Roders. Hey guys. Today we have a very special guest who is 23 years old. She works at Turning Point USA as a contributor and she is also a new author of the book Frontlines. So go check that out in the description below. You can order that. And also she has a show with Turning Point called Freedom Seeds. So please make sure again to check that out. And without further ado, here is Isabel Brown. Isabel, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here with you. Yeah, we had um, Charlie Kirk on and Erica Franzve and Charlie Kirk's fiance. So it's awesome to have you. We've seen you on the Charlie Kirk show and you were just on Newsmax. You've been on Fox and all that stuff. So being with us today is such a blessing. We know you're busy. So mm. thanks so much. And the first question we're going to ask is, who are you and what do you do? That's the million dollar question <laughs> the right there. Question. Right? <laughs> so my name is Isabel Brown. I'm currently a spokesperson and contributor for Turning Point USA, which is America's largest and fastest growing youth conservative organization. My job for Turning Point looks different every single day. So I'm sort of a jack of all trades and wearing a lot of hats at different times. Uh, but essentially, I represent what the mission of our organization is to equip and empower the next generation of leaders in America in traditional media. Sometimes that looks like TV interviews, which I literally just got mm -hmm. off a few seconds ago <laughs> uh, on radio and in, in print media as well. And then on the digital media side of things as well, particularly with our Turning Point Productions team, we have invested so much in the last few years into making shows and more content that exists only online or through social media platforms, because culturally that's where we can reach individuals in my generation to try to make a difference and start to educate them about some of these ideas that we call conservative values. Mm -hmm. And then of course, to our students every day. So I get to travel every semester to many of our college campuses. I'll be going to 10 different schools, I think, uh -huh. here in the next few weeks on eight different trips across the country, including Hawaii, which uh -huh. I'm not complaining about, <laughs> which will be very fun. Um, but I just get to interact and communicate with so many different people, thousands of our students every day through different mediums and different opportunities. And I'm so grateful for that. But I never expected that I would be working in this job. So to give you a little bit of a background on my educational upbringing and just how I got to where I am today, I went to college to become a biomedical scientist. Wow. And my dream was to become a trauma surgeon. So I picked a big research school in my home state of Colorado, Colorado State University, which was pretty notorious for being the big cowboy agricultural school in northern Colorado, mm -hmm. almost to the border of Wyoming. And I chose science for a very intentional reason, because I love the pursuit of objective truth. Mm -hmm. I think that's what drives so much of the foundation of my faith and my relationship with God, but also how I live my day to day life every single day, wanting to run after objective truth as much as possible. And traditionally in science, that's never been something in dispute. Science has always been about the black and white, the right mm -hmm. and wrong, what we do know versus what we've proven wrong. Uh, and making sure that we can prove how the universe works, which I believe is very symbiotic to our walk with God mm -hmm. and wanting to understand more of how the world works every single day in his perfect design. And of course, I experienced something completely contrary to what my expectations were on my college campus. I was often brutally attacked as an outspoken conservative later on in my college years. But before I really found my political voice and my courage to speak up, I was blown away, not just about the attack on conservative values or Christian ideas on a public college campus, but the complete attack on objective truth. Mm -hmm. In my classes like physiology, I was taught, yes, there are two sets of chromosomes, but actually gender is a social construct. <laughs> so just completely ignore everything that we already taught you. Or we walked through every tiny miracle that has to happen in the fetal development process only to be told a few months later that you actually weren't ending the unique life of a human being in an abortion procedure that wasn't actually murder. So forget about the fact that babies can feel pain a few weeks after they're developed in the womb, that their nervous system is almost immediately formed, that a heartbeat is formed almost instantly. Unique fingerprints are formed almost instantly. Forget about all of that because the political narrative is actually a lot more important. Mm -hmm. And of course, even in my classes like organic chemistry and physics, we spent so much more time 
talking about the southern border wall or why free speech isn't applicable today anymore or who voted for president donald trump and why they were an evil white supremacist <laughs> for doing so than everything i was actually paying my tuition for so it was so eye-opening in my classroom but also beyond when i started to get involved in extracurriculars on campus namely student government just how strong the chokehold of leftism was <laughs> at even a big cowboy agricultural yeah. school in Northern Colorado. This wasn't Harvard or Berkeley or any school that was notorious for having this sort of environment. This was the last place on earth that you could possibly imagine this behavior would be taking place. So after a while, I was frustrated and I saw no one speaking up for the things that I believed in, for my faith, for my opportunity to tell the truth in my classes, for me to become a well-educated scientist and treat people when I became a doctor. And I was so frustrated about that reality that I said, you know, if nobody else is going to start speaking up for conservative values, it's gonna have to be me. Mm -hmm. And I chose to do that through starting a Turning Point USA chapter on my campus. For those who don't know, and if you haven't listened to the episode with Charlie yet of this podcast, a chapter is essentially a club of conservatives on campus. So Turning Point chapters work to educate people about what conservative values are, to tell people that socialism sucks, mm -hmm. and then back that up with the truth and the mm -hmm. facts behind that. And just to reach younger people in a relatable way that helps open their eyes to the reality of the political left in America today. As you can expect, the hatred that I received from that was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Uh, for a few years, as that turning point girl, as I was often called by professors and students on campus, I received constant threats of violence. People who I knew personally threatened to harm or rape me. Mm -hmm. I received so many death threats. Uh, my address to my one bedroom apartment was doxxed. And if you don't know what that is, it means posted online without my permission. Mm -hmm. So the student government office, my college classrooms, everywhere on campus, and even the apartment where I lived no longer felt safe. And it was so eye-opening to realize just how far the woke progressive, although they're not truly progressive, political left will go to silence anyone who even raises their hand to question their behavior, their tactics, and their narrative. They will do absolutely anything they can to make sure that you stop speaking up, that you stop fighting for the things that you believe in. I luckily chose to push through all of that, even when I had so many friends and family members and mentors choose to walk out of my life as a result of that. And I learned the hard way, so hopefully my book can help you avoid the hard way, that when you push through these circumstances that nobody tells you are worth it, on the other side, you create a massive cultural movement in your community that inspires other people to speak up to. Mm -hmm. I think sadly, within the church and society today, people are afraid to be the different one. Yeah. They're afraid to be that first person to stand up, to get that backlash associated with their values and their beliefs. Uh, and we're forgetting that as Christians and people who are told by the word of God, the thing that we believe in so fundamentally, to tell the truth, to go out into the world and make new disciples and share the good news, that we're going to be hated mm -hmm. because of that. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important that people remember this world is not our home. This mm -hmm. world is mm -hmm. going to revile and hate us for the words that we use and telling the truth and fighting back against this cultural narrative. But it's so worth it in the end because you have an opportunity to change so many minds. Mm -hmm. So that's how I really fell in love with advocacy and activism was on my college campus. And then after I graduated from CSU, I moved more into the social media and traditional media space with Turning Point USA and several other companies as an independent contractor. And now I get to create content and represent the conservative movement and Christian values on social media, online, and uh, giving speeches and public speaking as well. Amen. That's good. Oh, and what, that. what gave you, um, what allowed you to push through? Because I may have some ideas, but for those of, there's a lot of people who haven't even spoken up because they're just afraid. Yeah, but for those who are maybe facing the backlash and everything, how would you encourage them? Like, uh, it's probably written in your book, but if you can give like a snippet, what about that? How do you push through that? Well, first I'll give a preface with this. I think there's so many people in the conservative and political influencer movement, for lack of a better word. By the way, I hate that word, <laughs> influencer. It's my least favorite word, yeah. but it's really the only word that exists to describe yeah. what I do, so I'll have to put up with it. Um, I think there's this assumption that you have to just brush it off your shoulder and say, that didn't hurt, it didn't really get to me. It does, mm. it hurts really bad, yeah. and it is terrible. When people call you things like transphobic or anti-woman or white supremacist, 
I cannot tell you how many times I've been called Nazi Barbie or <laughs> white power Barbie uh, because of how I look. Yeah, I mean, the most atrocious names that you possibly can imagine. And today, unfortunately, uh, supporters of our former president, Donald Trump, or conservatives are even being labeled as domestic terrorists wanting to completely take down our country. That's the new label after January the yeah. 6th and the events that happened at the U.S. Capitol, which, by the way, for the millionth time, I do not condone whatsoever. I vehemently <laughs> condemned that over and over again. But the left doesn't yeah, want to hear exactly. that, right? They don't want to hear that we're not okay with that behavior because it doesn't fit the narrative. So I think it's okay to take a moment and say, wow, that hurt mm -hmm. really bad. And it's important to recognize that because you see the severity of what that name calling does to another human being. They are intent on destroying your reputation, your relationships, your opportunity to succeed in life with zero opportunity for grace and forgiveness, mm -hmm. which especially within the church is the exact opposite of everything we believe. We believe that every human being is imperfect mm -hmm. and makes mistakes, but they always have an opportunity to reconcile those decisions and those mistakes with their personal relationship with God. Instead, you're outing every mistake that every person has ever made, even if it was 10 years ago, or calling them these things completely unwarranted by just tacking labels onto someone who's never made a mistake to begin with. So it's okay to feel that hurt, to mm -hmm. recognize that this behavior is not okay and should not be part of our cultural narrative and norm today. Mm -hmm. But then you have to decide what to do with mm -hmm. that. When I first got called a racist in student government, I went home and I cried for two weeks. <laughs> I couldn't possibly have imagined how I lived my life in a way that led someone else to believe I valued one human being over mm -hmm. another, especially given the very, very diverse background of my own personal extended family. We're talking every race, mm -hmm. every gender identity, every sexual orientation, nationality, language spoken, political background. And I'd always been taught in my own family that a person's a person and they're equally deserving of love as anyone else. Mm -hmm. We're all made in the image of God. So we should never just jump to assumptions that one person is valued more than another simply based on how they live their life or how they fill out a ballot every November. My decision to push through that really came from a personal reflection and going back to what I know is my foundation as the word of God, as objective truth, that if I was getting all this hatred and this backlash for saying nothing controversial to begin with, really that gender is an actual thing or that everyone should have the freedom to speak their mind and advocate for the things that they believe in or practice their own faith in their own way, things that apply to everybody, not just some people, mm -hmm. that probably meant I was walking in the right mm -hmm. direction because I knew what I was saying was the truth. And if it was the truth, I knew that by saying the truth, I was going to be hated in this world because mm -hmm. of that. There's infinite verses mm -hmm. in the word of God and the gospels mm -hmm. talking about just how severe the hatred is going to be for outspoken Christians, people who believe in objective truth to begin with, mm -hmm. because they hated God for doing the mm -hmm. same thing yep. when he was here in flesh on earth as Jesus Christ. So when I realized that awakening, it didn't really matter what people called me as many times as they yeah. called me it. I just continued to get up over and over again and prove them wrong that I wasn't going to be silenced by the hatred and the backlash and the fear associated with that. But I was intent on convincing other people that it was worth it to do too. Amen. Mm -hmm. I love that. And it's so good, like you were saying, to remind people, this is not our home. Like we're not living just for pleasure and comfort. Because if you were doing that right, you would just probably... Um, compromise be like okay like I'll stop talking but it's like as Christians we're told like you said we're told there's going to be persecution and I like how Charlie was saying it to remind ourselves James 1 count it all joy when you suffer and mm -hmm. you go through these things because it it helps refine us too it helps us have that perseverance to go until the end right until I love that saying it's like if you're not dead, God's not done. So until the day we die, we're going to keep fighting and standing for truth. So we're mm -hmm. so thankful that you have done that. You're continuing to do that, right? A uh, young age, even though people always say, oh, you're so young, 23. But this is hopefully encouraging people, whatever age you are, it doesn't matter that don't despise your youth. Don't let anyone, like that verse says, 1 Timothy 4.12, don't let anyone look down at you because you're young, but be an example for the believer in speech, in life, in love, and faith and impurity so not just what we say but how we live and so a lot of times can you maybe talk a little bit about that it's not just what you say but it's how you live because people right they're also looking at how you live we can't just say oh i'm a christian in word only like we need to live it out so can you explain the importance of what it looks like to walk as a conservative christian not just because it makes me sad how a lot of people are like oh i'm conservative but 
you look at their life and they're kind of living like very, very worldly and not what the Bible is saying, like that God is saying. So can you explain why that's important also how you live out your life? That is such a good point and something that we don't talk a lot about in politics. And I wish we did more often because ultimately actions speak so much louder than words. Mm -hmm. And I know that that's so cliche. (laughs) Everybody says it all the time, but it's so true because the way you live your life says so much more than something you said in an interview Mm -hmm. or on a post on social media or even just in passing to a friend. It's that repetitive behavior and finding joy in the behavior that you have that inspires other people to make changes in their own life, to seek a relationship with God, to take accountability for their own life, uh, and to regain that autonomy over themselves instead of blaming everything on other people and expecting a bigger entity like Hmm. the government to come step Hmm. in and save them from their own destructive behavior. I think ultimately what it means to be a conservative all centers around this idea of being responsible to something. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing in the left right now the idea that you're never responsible for anything. Everything is always somebody else's fault. And you can always point the finger and blame them. When we have political discourse and disagreement in this country, it's those evil conservatives (laughs) causing it. When somebody said something mean to you, that's completely them. It's never your fault, even if it was warranted or you provoked that response in some way you're not responsible for your own health which is what you're seeing in the body positivity movement Mm -hmm. right now completely ignoring your responsibility to care for yourself that way you're not responsible for your own finances let's just completely relieve all student loan debt and just forget that it completely exists Mm -hmm. regardless of what choices you made in your education that list could go on and on and on but it all centers around this idea that you never have to be accountable Mm -hmm. to yourself or to someone else that you can always expect the gracious big government (laughs) to step in and take care of you when things go south. Conservatism, I believe, is a compassionate solution to the problems that humanity faces every day. And I wish more leftists were able to hear me say that because they say the party of compassion is always on the left side of the aisle. If you really care about people and you want them to be rich, if you want them to have their own choices, if you want them to be in love, you have to side with this side of leftism. Mm -hmm. But conservatism is rooted in actual solutions Mm -hmm. to solve inequality, to solve poverty, to solve an inability to start your own business or make your own decisions. Mm -hmm. It's completely rooted in this idea that you have autonomy over your own life. Mm -hmm. You don't have to listen to the umbrella of government above your head. And capitalism, which goes along with that, has lifted truly billions of people out of poverty Mm -hmm. within the last few decades. If we're really serious about solving inequality, about ending poverty, ending hunger, uh, and so many other problems that humanity faces, we should be looking for tangible solutions that actually work to make that happen, and that's rooted in conservatism. Mm -hmm. Sadly, people don't know that. They just think conservatives are these old, rich, white guys who don't care about the rest of the world and never will because they're primarily dominated by profit and they're driven by greed. But that is so far from Mm -hmm. the truth. And so I think this reframing and remarketing of what it means to be a conservative and what we do every day at Turning Point USA to explain to people, we come at this from a compassionate level and a compassionate point of view, wanting to make everyone's lives better. That's gonna be so important when it comes to changing people's minds and then more importantly, their behavior. Because when they feel accountable to themselves and taking care of themselves, that's when they'll start to feel more accountable about caring for their loved ones, for their friends, for their family, then their community, then their country, then their world. We don't have to wait for the government to do that. We can do that right Amen. now. And I love that, like, even you talking about hard work, because, like, I was doctor, was it Dr. Jordan Peterson? He was saying, like, so many people are depressed and there's, like, easy solutions. Like, get a job. Like, go outside, <laughs> be in the sunlight. Don't be in mm. your mom's basement, like, playing video games all day. <laughs> make your bed. <laughs> make your bed. and Make your bed. That's yeah, cute. And, it starts with the little things, but nobody does mm-hmm. that. Yeah. What are some other things that you would encourage people like if they're right now just feeling like, oh, my goodness, look at Isabel. She has a book. She has a show. She has a clothing, like all this stuff. But I can't do that. Like, I'm not like her. Like, what would you say just an encouragement to them? Like, it's the little things. Like, what are some things that maybe you do that you would encourage people to also implement? I think it all starts with finding a purpose Mm -hmm. for yourself and your life. And I think we get so overwhelmed by this idea of what's God's plan for my life and I have to find it and I have to do it perfectly. And until I find it, then I can't do anything. I just have to sit on the couch and wait for him to tell me exactly (laughs) what my purpose is. I have changed my mind on so many different things over and over and over again. 
If I had had it my way originally, I would be in medical school right now, probably miserable because of all of the insane indoctrination happening for our poor doctors, which by the way, many of them are not even going to class in person right now because of the COVID regulations. So I'm terrified yeah. for the time we all have to go to the doctor's oh, office mm-hmm. and they all Google things. So that's great, by the way, just be, be aware of that in the future. Um, but it starts with just finding something that you're passionate about because that is God's mm-hmm. call for your life. We all have unique passions. We all have an ability to fall in love with something that's different from one another. And when we invest our time and our resources and our energy into those things, that's when your calling becomes a reality. And then you can start running after those things. Uh, I didn't start out with a lot of Instagram followers (laughs) or writing a book or anything. I had to figure it out the hard way all on my own. And it took hundreds of hours, I'm not exaggerating, Mm. of watching YouTube videos on video production and how to do Adobe and design things in graphic design and Photoshop or literally Googling how to write a book. (laughs) Yes, it all started right there because I had an idea, but I had no idea where I was going with my journey. And you don't have to have it all figured out right away. It starts with the tiny things of make your bed, make sure that you're, you know, exercising and taking care of your body and your mind continue your relationship with God and don't give up on that spiritual Mm -hmm. foundation because when things do get difficult, that's where you can draw inspiration and strength from. And then just put one foot in front of the Mm -hmm. other. And if you fail, you fail. It's okay. That happens all the time. I've made decisions that didn't work out the way that I wanted them to. And I've made mistakes along the way too, but you only can learn from those things if you actually continue moving forward. I'd be faithful with the little things. And then like you said, step out. You gotta, you're never going to know until you try, you know? And Absolutely. Have, have people said that to you? Probably, but have they said, oh, it's just all been given to you, like, and they play mm-hmm. the victim? Do you hear that a lot? Yeah, occasionally, not very frequently, mm-hmm. but mostly from the left, and they'll assume certain things about my life and my family because of my obvious identities, <laughs> what I look like, what town I grew up in, and it's so unfortunate because we've become so good in our society at boiling people down to what they look like and completely assuming everything about them just based on that one reality. Mm. When the truth is we're so much more complex than that. Everybody has a story to tell. Everybody's Mm. had difficulties that they've walked through and a journey that we know nothing about. And rather than assuming the best in people, we're always assuming the worst in people and just treating them as if, everything's been handed to them. Mm -hmm. My life's so much difficult than yours. And we need to just reconcile that and do whatever we can to make my life better than yours now, because you've just had it all your whole life. That's so disappointing. And it cheapens the human experience Mm -hmm. so much because the most successful people in life are often the ones who've had to walk through some of the hardest journeys. And there's so much that we can learn from them. But instead, we're villainizing them and just treating them as if they're nothing to look up to or emulate in this life. Yeah. And, and the, if you read the Bible, like it talks about how God uses the weak and foolish things. Like if anything, people who maybe have ha- have it all together and can be prideful thinking, oh, look at me, I can. They have to be careful, but they need to know like God gives everyone an opportunity when you surrender to God. Like, I mean, just in life in general, like we in living in America, like everyone has the opportunity like in here. But I think the sad thing is it is true. Like I've had people tell me that I have white privilege and I'm like, I don't understand like what I've done. Like, can you explain to me? And Charlie was talking about people like you're you're a racist. And he's like, how? Like, what have I done just for you being a male and being white? And I'm like, like, prove that you're not racist. Like, and that's like, for me, this girl was upset with me because I had green eyes and she wanted lighter eyes. And I'm like, I'm sorry. Like, (laughs) that's not god gave me that and i said you take that up with god because the Mm -hmm. person you should be upset with then is how god created you and when you read the bible it says who are you to say right to the like to the creator like all this stuff like we we need to understand Mm -hmm. like our purpose in life isn't to have everyone love us and like us that's not the goal in life the goal is to serve god and to love god and love others so that's where i just get excited too when we realized that all the answers, like it was in Ali Bestucky's podcast, it says all the problems men face are in the covers of the Bible. Like we have the truth. That's the thing that Charlie was saying the left doesn't have. Like they don't have the truth. They don't have, right? Most of them, like they don't believe in the Bible. They don't believe in that. So they don't have the truth. And so what would you say to people like some maybe verses or some encouragement of why it's also important to, you know, have a relationship with God like you're talking about and to be a Christ follower and to read the the word of God. Why is that important? 
Oh my gosh. So first I want to respond to some of the other <laughs> yes, things yes, that you said, course. because that was all so great. And I agree with all of it. I love what you said about God giving everyone opportunities. And we forget that in society mm-hmm. today, instead of focusing on opportunity, we're always focusing on oppression. Yeah. And I yeah. love that story about, I think it was the guy drowning in the ocean and there's a rowboat yeah. that mm-hmm. comes along and then there's a bigger boat that comes mm-hmm. along and a cruise ship that yeah. comes along. <laughs> And the guy says, God, why didn't you save me? And he says, I sent you all of these opportunities. Why were you not paying attention? So always open your eyes. There's always opportunity every single day, even if it just means opening your eyes in the morning and realizing that you have a full day in front of Mm -hmm. you to do whatever you want with it. So never give up on the opportunity to make your life better and to honor God in any way that you can through your own passions. I love Ali Beth Stuckey, and I think she is such an important role model Mm -hmm. today when it comes to how to blend your Christian background and the things that you believe in religiously with your political lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Because sadly, in the church today, really every denomination across the United States of America, we're letting society dictate the church instead of the other way around. And so many pastors and priests alike have fallen victim to making leftism the religion of their Mm -hmm. church instead of letting the faith that we have in God and the literal manual of objective truth, Mm -hmm. the Gospels, and the Bible dictate what society should look Mm -hmm. like. Everything is about feel good Christianity, Mm -hmm. as I call it. And it's about saying I can justify my decisions and every bad decision that I make and my repetitive negative behavior with, I'll just be forgiven anyway, Mm -hmm. because God forgives all of us and I don't have to change the way that I live my life to make this world a better place or my life a better place. So I don't know that I would necessarily have specific verses to point people towards, because I think the entire Mm -hmm. Bible really is this manuscript Mm -hmm of an opportunity for you to live a full and meaningful life. And that doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. In fact, every single story in the Bible about any human being is wrought with difficulty, with challenges, with obstacles that we have to overcome. And we certainly are not promised that we're going to be liked in this life for doing the right things and saying the right things and sharing the truth with this world. In fact, we are overtly promised that we're going to be hated and reviled in this life. So If everybody likes you and you're not really ruffling any feathers, that's probably a sign that you're not living a very biblical or godlike life. But rather, if you're starting to get some of that backlash for sharing the truth with your community, for speaking up about Christian values, about your political background, about why you make the decisions you do, that's probably a good sign that you're walking in the right direction. The Bible says that. Oh, sorry. Yeah, but I I was going to say the Bible says. Check out. Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, real quick. Yeah, I didn't mean to cut you off. But the Bible says that. It says, woe to you when all men speak well of you. You know, kind of like the false prophets or the Pharisees. So I was just going to throw that in there. You go. (laughs) But that's so true. And over and over again, we see words like you will be hated. Mm. Hated is a very extreme word, you guys. It's not just saying, oh, people probably won't want to be your friend. It means people are actually going to come after you and spread some of the most insane lies about who you are and your character possible because they're afraid that you're walking with the Mm -hmm. truth. So look at the images that we have of people like you and me, fallible, imperfect people throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. Nobody was perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, And everybody made, you know, mistakes and bad decisions in their life and often faced some very extreme tragedy and trial and conflict. But if Saul can be transformed into Paul and then Mm -hmm. he dies in prison, talking about how much his life has been fulfilled with this love of God, with a purpose in his life, even amidst all of that suffering and finding the joy, going back to that, in that process and in that journey, anything is possible for any of us today too. And I think we forget that the Bible is applicable to our life today, even though it was written thousands of years ago. It seems so far off and almost like a fictional story, but it's not. It's reality. And there's so many lessons that are applicable to what you're walking through right now with this societal backlash, with feeling isolated from your community because you don't live in this world. You're focusing on the next world and trying to make earth a little bit more like heaven, as we Mm -hmm. say in many of our prayers in Christianity. Uh, But there's so many great role models to look up to in the Bible. So read the stories of Job, of Mary Magdalene, of Paul, of everybody. And just learn that there is purpose even in the difficulty. Mm -hmm. And that's probably a sign that you are living a very godly Mm -hmm. life. And don't feel like, oh, I'm too far gone. I've sinned too much. Like, God can't forgive me. Because if you just humble yourself, like, he will forgive you. Like, Mm -hmm. we were just saying how Ravi Zacharias, like, that whole thing, it made, it shocked a lot of people. But when you put your hope in a person and you're disillusioned there when that happens, that's, that's bad. Because then... 
it like we should just have our hope in Jesus Christ because he never changes, right? He is perfect. Mm -hmm. People aren't perfect. And this is why I kind of segue into like President Trump. Like everyone was so mad. Well, how could you be voting for this guy? And it's like, we're not voting for a person. We're voting for a policy. Like he is, he's the most, he was the most pro-life president ever and all these different things. And then now we see that he was trying to be canceled. So when people are like, oh, if the president was canceled and social media and that like what about me like and so many people then are afraid to talk they don't say anything right they don't say anything on thanksgiving dinners to their family they don't talk about jesus or anything because they're afraid right canceled like done mm -hmm. like me and my friends joke about that like when someone says something that's a little like like hurtful because we say <laughs> we always say better the wounds of a friend than the kisses of the enemy and our joke is canceled like i didn't like that but it's like <laughs> that's literally what the leftists like are doing like they yeah. do that all the time and if you think about it then samson canceled right he was a terrible but he was in the hall of faith and that just shows like if you humble yourself and that's why we were saying with robbie like the difference was he's not like king david he didn't humble himself but when you humble yourself like if you have messed up there's forgiveness like instantly yeah maybe trust is earned and all that stuff but there's forgiveness and you're right with god and right right standing with him you should have a peace and so what would you say, just segueing into the cancel culture with all these people, like mm -hmm. they're afraid to post anything. They're afraid to say anything. Like, have you ever experienced that? Or what would you encourage people with like social media or different things with being canceled? I love that joke. And we do that all the time with <laughs> me and my friends too. You're canceled, canceled. if you say anything remotely <laughs> offensive, but it's funny, but it's not yeah. funny at the yeah. same time. You know what I mean? Because that is reality mm -hmm. that everybody's living with. And of course, I have been afraid to post things online and I've been scared of having conversations with people mm -hmm. about my true beliefs, my true values as a college student. And now I do this professionally for a living mm -hmm. and it can be scary to go on national yeah. television mm -hmm. and say what you believe and to post things on social media that your fr your family and your friends, your grandma, who's a crazy liberal yeah. is going to see and end up coming after you for that. It happens all the time. And that fear doesn't always go away, but it's the choice to push through that fear mm -hmm. and make a conscious choice to do the right thing when the world is demanding that you do the wrong thing in the name of being morally correct, whatever that's PC. supposed to mean when we constantly yeah. have changing morals. Um, but cancel culture is a problem for so many reasons, but primarily because there's no opportunity for grace or forgiveness. Yeah. If you've ever made a mistake, you're canceled forever. Yeah. And they will make sure that your reputation, your relationships, your livelihood, your job, your ability to go to college, your scholarships at college, anything will be completely destroyed simply because maybe you made a mistake or you were associated yeah. remotely with somebody else who ever made a mistake. And that's exactly what we're seeing with President Trump right now. I can't tell you how many times I have been told, well, Isabel, you're an outspoken Christian. How could you possibly vote for someone who said X, mm -hmm. Y, Z ever in their life? And the answer that I usually like to give people is I'm not voting for a pastor when I'm choosing mm -hmm. who goes into the Oval Office. I'm voting for a president and I'm voting for a leader that can stand up to the realities of this world with truth and go and bat for those Amen. things and fight for those things when things get difficult. And this president was overwhelmingly yep. a pretty Christian president, mm -hmm. whether or not you want to judge his personal relationship with God, which I don't feel I have an opportunity mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. Anybody's mm -hmm. walk with God is their personal business. And no matter what mistakes you made in your past, you're always eligible to have that reconciliation and grace with God. So my hope is that President Trump does have a great relationship with God. And I think we saw a lot of that manifesting through his actions. Remember, I said actions are so much more important than words throughout his term as president of the United States, protecting the unborn, regardless of where they came yeah. from, ensuring human rights here and around the world. Let's not forget about the many, many peace deals signed in the Middle East and yeah. North Korea, all over the world to make sure that people had the opportunity to live every day safely and practice their religion, uh, providing more opportunities for people to start their own business, to make their dream a reality and provide for their family, protecting religious liberties, mm -hmm. especially during this time of COVID-19, which has been so devastating. Mm -hmm for the church and the ability of people to assemble and gather and worship God in their own chosen way. So there are so many things that anybody can say about a politician. Okay. No person is ever perfect and everybody has said crass or brazen <laughs> things in the past, but I'm so much more focused on the actions and the day-to-day mm -hmm. -day steps that any president is taking to protect human mm -hmm. life and ensure liberty for everyone 
than what they say in an interview. And as a side note, not that I'm telling you at all what president you should support, but you should be very alarmed that two alleged Christians, one being Catholic, are sitting in the White House right now dictating policies that have nothing to do with what we believe in as Christians, completely eroding any protection for the unborn, including partial birth abortions, which they want to protect in the White House and at the federal level today, letting millions and millions and millions of undocumented individuals into this country who will illegally traffic people across the border, illegally traffic drugs across the border, guns which are illegally trafficked across the southern border and will ultimately ultimately end up harming individuals here in the United States, driving crime through the roof, defunding our police, mm-hmm. so making sure it's not safe for you in your community, even to practice your own religion, ensuring that churches can be shut down mm-hmm. simply because of fear of a virus. This should be alarming to every Christian. And I've already seen thousands and thousands of posts myself on social media from people who say they regret their vote from November of 2020, but it's eye-opening to realize that what people are saying about themselves and what they believe in does not always match what their actions look like. And that's what we should be judging people off of when it comes to their political performance, not something that they may have said or tweeted. And by the way, I loved the Twitter. I thought it was great from (laughs) President Trump. What a fun way to connect with our president. But I do miss President Trump's leadership. I'm sure he's not down and out for the count. He's going to continue impacting our political Mm -hmm. sphere in so many different ways after his term has now wrapped up. And I'm hopeful that more and more people will have their eyes Mm -hmm. opened to the role Christianity and an objective truth-based system and morally-based system should play in our political sphere. Mm -hmm. Amen. And I love how Charlie was saying it too. It's like, He's like, in a weird way, it's kind of good because all the things I've been trying to warn people, now it's just, it's obvious. It's clear. I don't have to like tell people what's really like you need to believe this because they are seeing it firsthand and so that's Mm -hmm. my prayer through all of this and that like charlie was also saying this sunday when he came to our church like i don't want this to discourage you guys to be like oh everything's rigged i'm not even gonna vote i'm not even gonna do this like i'm not gonna go to church because i don't want something to happen it's like no like we need to continue to stand for truth and realize too that god will reward us for that like god will like the Bible talks about he's never seen the righteous forsaken or the children of God begging for bread. Like when you're in Christ, and I also encourage people, like when you read the Bible, just being a giver, like if you're always a consumer and a taker, like you just become bitter and angry. But when you're blessing others, when you're giving, it truly does bless you in the end. Like mm-hmm. there's favor from the Lord. And so I I love that about President Trump. Like he's such a giver. Like And I love that he's a fighter. Like my dad, Mm -hmm. he's from New York. And so my dad reminds um, us a lot of President Trump. Mm -hmm. He'll just say the hard things. He doesn't sugarcoat things. Our dad's the pastor of this church, Calvary Mm -hmm. Valley. And we love that about him because so many Mm -hmm. pastors are afraid to speak up because they're like, hey, I don't want to get my 501c3 taken away. Like, I don't want. um, But really, it comes down to fear of man. Yeah. That's why, why, like you were saying, pastors aren't speaking up. They're even jellyfish. And and a lot of pastors don't even say um, what you're saying, that we're going to be hated. They just say, hey, become a Christian. Everything's great, Hmm. you know? And but you see, it's gonna feel so yeah. good. You're gonna be so loved and welcomed. <laughs> yeah. and yeah. It's always gonna feel great. That is so no. not true. That is a load of bullshit right there. And if your mm. pastor is telling you that, they probably are not a very truth seeking yeah, pastor. No. It's true. Yeah, and we need to tell them the truth. You don't wanna, you want them to count the cost, and you don't want to just make it scary for them so they never come. It's not like that. But they do need to count right. the cost. And if you really do take the time to count the cost, the suffering, the persecution here is worth it, right? Amen. It's it's not anything compared to in eternity to yeah. he- in hell, you know? So that's why we need to speak the truth because it's really important for people's salvation. So, yeah. Amen, amen. Yeah. And so next question we want to ask you about um, is for the Gen Zers out there because mm. I'm a Gen Z, you're a Gen Z. Morgan is on the border, I actually. You're, I was nine, yeah, born in ninety five. So a little millennial. <laughs> yeah, millennial. You're you're a millennial. Sad. <laughs> Sad. <laughs> it's right oh, on the funny. cusp. <laughs> but um, I want to ask you for Gen Zers and just for anyone out there, what do you think the future is going to look like for us? Like, um, and mm. also like, how do we stay in the fight? Mm. Like. And Can we talk about mental health too? Oh yeah, so what because, we'll do after that, so yeah. I'll have you answer that, but after that what we want to do is we're going to 
I'm going to tell people, we're going to tell them about your show, Freedom Seeds, and then the different topics you've had, we're going to just kind of bring them up and then you can share your little one minute advice with them. Perfect. So yeah. Love All that. right. So, um, so yeah, Gen Z, what would you say? Just encouragement for your fellow people out there. <laughs> In so many ways, Gen Z has already surpassed everyone's expectations in good and bad yeah. ways. But we've already mm -hmm. proven ourselves to be the most socially, culturally, and politically engaged generation in a very long time. Whether you're on the right side of the aisle and you're working with groups like Turning Point USA, which is present on thousands of college campuses with hundreds of chapter members at every college, or you're organizing things like the March for Our Lives on the other side of the coin, people are engaged in the process and they recognize the need for active participation in our culture, for better or for worse. So I think the problem with millennials, and no offense to anyone who's yeah. listening to this, is there was this extreme attitude of apathy, yeah. that it didn't mm. matter what one person said or did or what they could contribute to changing culture. And that apathy is what let some of this hysteria take over and why you know there's infinity genders now and why you can't say what you believe in and why many unfortunately people believe that we have to burn our system to the ground yeah. literally that's exactly what antifa and black yeah. lives matter incorporated that's what i like to differentiate the organization from the saying uh with is that incorporated statement there but people are so far removed from reality that they don't know how to come back, mm -hmm. I think, from, from the millennial generation. And we've put ourselves so far into a corner that we've backed into that it's impossible to move forward mm -hmm. in any way. So Gen Z gets the need to be involved and to impact culture in some way. And they're doing that through social media, on their college campuses, and having conversations with their friends, for better or worse. And I put that stipulation in there as well, mm -hmm. because obviously cancel culture is alive and well as we're all starting to graduate from our college campuses. And there's this tug of war that we call a culture war at Turning Point USA on what we want our culture to look like in America and around the world moving forward. I think the difference now is not that we need to inspire people to get involved, it's that we need to educate them on what is the truth mm -hmm. and then start walking in that direction towards sharing the truth with other people. Uh, you know, we have a wealth of knowledge at our fingertips. And unfortunately, with censorship, with cancellation of outspoken conservatives, with their inability to go to church every weekend in many places around the world, we're lacking our ability to access that information in many ways. So it requires all of us to get involved in the process, to do something about it. Yeah. I knew nothing about social media, about video production, about public speaking. Well, I did do high school speech and debate, so there was yeah. that. But in terms of speaking on political issues or cultural issues or even religious issues before I just got started. Mm -hmm. And all it takes is one Amen. step in that direction. Post one tweet, make one video sitting in your car, not driving, please. <laughs> but like my friend Graham Allen, who sits in his driveway and records himself in the driver's seat all the mm -hmm. time, just ranting about the things that he's passionate mm -hmm. about. Have one conversation with a friend over coffee that you politically disagree with and just talk to each other. Mm -hmm. Get the information out there because it's very hard to compete with the truth. Right. I always like to say that truth has a ring to it. We always hear that in culture. Mm -hmm. And that's why people are so naturally gravitated towards embracing truth and walking in it, but mm -hmm. only if they're exposed to it. And that is why the left is so intent on shutting down any difference of opinion on college mm -hmm. campuses, because once you're exposed to the truth, you generally want to follow it and apply it into your own life. That's just how we're hardwired. Mm -hmm as human beings. So now it's up to us to actually get the truth out there and everybody can make that happen, whether that's on social media mm -hmm. or just talking to a friend over coffee. Yeah. And Charlie Kirk, he was saying that, he was saying, um, those who are just consumers on social media, you probably should just get off. Go on but parlors, if you're, yeah, but if you're a publisher, and I think people, like you're saying, people can be publishers. They just need to start anybody speaking the can. truth, you know? Instead of just posting pictures about themselves and how, how cool they are, you know, but they should be putting out that truth, you know. Amen. So maybe instead of just canceling or, you know, canceling, but shutting down your social media, maybe start to be an, not an influencer. You don't like that word. No, but <laughs> a publisher, it's right? True, though. It's yeah. the only word that exists. <laughs> it's the cringy word. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's like the word, um, ointment to people for some reason they don't oh, like that yeah. word <laughs> she don't like it either Isabel's like nope please yep. don't um, <laughs> but the, and I love that too because we all have something to say like yeah. I love that even about interviews I had to learn that when starting is like it doesn't matter if you're interviewing even a homeless person like 
everyone has something to say everyone has something that you don't know that you know they've experienced with life and mm -hmm. just being interested too like interested in communicating people like i've had an issue like a lot of times with like communicating like i sometimes would rather just text someone or something mm -hmm. like that so i really had to push myself out there be like no i'm gonna call this person like even though mm -hmm. i feel like oh but then it's not forgiving because if i say something wrong right and then <laughs> doing these podcasts i'm like Oh my goodness! I say so, <laughs> stu stupid things all the time, but I'm like, or I did, I did that weird like yelling with like you, and I'm like, I'm so but awkward. But it just you have to laugh at yourself and not take yourself too seriously. That's why yeah. I tell people too. It's like, and I love I I love your Q and A's. So I encourage everyone to go check out right uh, the Isabel Brown on your social media. Is that what it is? Because That's you do so well on your Q and A's. You're just so natural, so fun, and you can tell that you're being who God created you to be. You're not mm -hmm. trying to be someone else. You're not trying to be these other people, right? You're not, because the Bible says, if you compare yourself to others, you're a fool. And so just being who God created you to be and just being natural, laughing at yourself, right? If you make a mistake, just like, it's okay. Because that's- <laughs> Yeah, what you guys don't see with those Q and A's is how many times I'm starting to answer a question and then I trip over my words and go, Bleh, and then I have to- <laughs> I yeah. love that because that's what I said with my friends. I'm always like, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, words, like words are not coming up, but you know what? It's okay. And just so for yes, people to know that fun. people, even like Isabel Brown, you guys- even if you look at her, like I look at her like, oh my goodness, Isabel, she would never talk to me. And you're just like the sweetest, most genuine, humble person. Like, mm -hmm. and I barely know you. I just met you. But yeah, I can sense that. And mm -hmm. you can truly sense the difference between someone trying to be an actor and be fake so they can get followers and someone who mm -hmm. is just, they're get, they're having the favor of the Lord. Like when you get your followers, it's not because, oh, look at me, I'm trying to post this and this. It's like, you really want the truth to be out there. And I really, so I respect you for that and look up to you for that. But speaking of that, you have Freedom Seeds, your new show with Turning Point USA that is out. And can you tell us like, how did you start that? And my first thing when I thought of the word, I'm like, I love that it says Freedom Seeds because I don't know if this is your reasoning for starting it, but this is how I took it. I'm like, like when it talks about just planting a seed, we don't have to just like change it all in one day, like, even that's the same thing with Christianity. It's like just planting that seed, telling them, hey, Jesus is the only way. And just saying, hey, God loves you. Or just, can I pray for you? Like little things or inviting someone to church. You don't have to like know the Romans road and like say the salvation prayer with people. Like you can just like a little seed. And then, mm -hmm. so anyway, tell us how it started. <laughs> what's the backing behind it and all that and how they can find it. Absolutely. I actually never thought about the comparison to the mustard seed idea, but I love that now. It there was you completely go. unintended, but it does line up pretty well. Um, you know, the name was kind of the fun part of when we got all of this started. We had this idea within our Turning Point Productions department to do something really short as mm -hmm. that introductory, just starting to ask the right questions style of content because everything else that we've done is pretty long form content. It's mm -hmm. hard to get people yeah. to sit down for 15 minutes or 20 minutes and listen to everything that you have to say. Mm -hmm. And honestly, changing minds starts with that one tiny thing at a time. It starts with asking the right question and then you follow up and go do all of that mm -hmm. other research that helps you end up at your conclusion. So the name idea really came from the Second Amendment community. If you're a big two way mm -hmm. advocate out there, you may know when you go shooting and the casing for your bullet flies out of the gun and lands on the ground, they say that that's planting a freedom seed. But we wanted <laughs> to go. plant a different seed, a seed of knowledge or information and just encouraging people to ask the right questions that helps drive our society more towards freedom. Mm -hmm. So that's where the name came from. And I thought that was pretty fun how we came up with that. But every day, Monday through Friday, I get to post a one minute video on social media it's usually give or take a few seconds between the one minute there, but the goal is to make it a very short snippet of information that you then can use and take out into your own life to impact culture in a positive way, whether that's sharing that on your own social media or bringing up that topic in class with your professor or talking about it with your friends. And it all centers around facts. We didn't want to do an opinion or commentary based show. We have plenty of those yeah. at Turning Point USA. <laughs> but instead fill this void in the market that nobody is covering right now, especially from mainstream media, to simply report data and facts and statistics and sources that you can trust and know that what you're looking at is objective truth. So we've had every single topic under the sun already, and it's only been a few weeks. Yeah. Everything from scientists know that life begins at conception mm -hmm. to you know China is the big problem in our world when it comes to plastic pollution in the ocean. 
uh, and everything outside of that as well. So we provide lots of evidence to go along with these videos and the sources pop up as you're watching it. And so far it's been pretty well received. So I'm excited to see how more people get to use these videos to impact culture in their own life. Yeah. And I love that because like so many times like people's attention span isn't there. Like they see, like they'll see our podcast and they'll see, oh my goodness, it's an hour long. I'm not going to watch that. But that's what I love about yours being a minute. So I encourage everyone to check that out because it's just like, like I forgot, oh, how do you say it? You say, I wrote it down to win. Um, oh man. Um, just giving you an arsenal of knowledge, but it said to win America's culture war. And mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah, we that. say we're going to give people ammo to win America's culture yeah, war, exactly. borrowing that from the Second Amendment community. I love that. And that's where I'm like, you learn something new every day. I go shooting, like I carry and all that, but I didn't even know that. So mm -hmm. you learn yeah. something new every day and you yeah. got to humble yourself. I'm like, <laughs> but um, so Morgan, you wrote some things down of the yeah. titles and things because we've watched all your videos why there's i don't know is there like 12 or something or how many uh, does she have yeah. but so that's only really like 12, 12 minutes think. guys yeah. you can watch them really quick yeah. but um there's a few that we want to like um i share want to talk then... about the most recent one that you talked yeah, about mental, mental health. health um so yeah with the lockdowns and the mm -hmm. coronavirus and everything how is that affecting people our world is forever different. Yeah. And truthfully, I don't know how we'll come back from these lockdowns. I'm hopeful that we will. And yeah. I believe that strong leadership will prevail during this time. But we have really experimented the limits of human capacity mm -hmm. in the last few years between 2020 and now with these lockdowns and completely fundamentally altering how we interact with each other as people, largely through a screen, not in person anymore. Yeah. Um, I was studying biomedical sciences, policy and advocacy in the 2019, 2020 school year for my master's degree at Georgetown. And I took many classes at Georgetown law. And most of my professors were experts in their chosen field of global health or healthcare policy. So I was learning from the top, top people at the WHO, at the CDC, mm -hmm. in our federal government, at the NIH, where Dr. Anthony Fauci made a name for himself. <laughs> and I cannot begin to highlight to you how many times I was told from these individuals in January when COVID-19 first emerged in China in the Wuhan prov province that lockdowns on a mass scale and mass quarantines do not work. <laughs> they cause way too many other problems. They actually spread the disease faster, yeah. believe it or not, because nobody listens, obviously. Yeah. So they're all in their own homes and then they're not outside. So disease spreads very, very quickly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they were vehemently condemning the decision from the Chinese government to shut down the Wuhan province. Mm. Fast forward a few weeks, two or three weeks after that, uh, and then you started to see attitudes change in the scientific community here in America, but the political realm especially. Mm. And at spring break time, so the first week of March, we were told from Georgetown, do not come back to Washington, D.C. If you left, just leave everything and come back later. Don't worry, it'll only be a few weeks. It'll be 15 days huh. to slow the spread, everybody. Just do your part, stay at home, be compassionate, uh, and listen to what we're telling you to help save lives. Well, it turns out we're actually harming lives yeah. at a much more alarming mm -hmm. rate than we ever could have predicted. And a lot of that, ignore the virus, has nothing to do with the virus, mm -hmm. has everything to do with mental health. And I did a one minute video uh, with Freedom Seeds about this that came out this morning. So you guys can go look at it on my personal Instagram. But we are experiencing literally record levels of anxiety, of depression, of suicide ideation, and of course, suicide attempts. And every time you turn on the news, I guarantee you at some point during the segment, you're going to hear about another teenager or child even who decided to take their own life because they don't see any hope anymore and they have no purpose for living. They think that is their literal only option when it comes to how to deal with the insane levels of anxiety and depression that honestly we're all dealing with right now. Everybody is facing some sort of heightened anxiety or depression. I'm the first to admit that. I've always really dealt with anxiety in my own life. But it's difficult because we don't know what the future is going to look like. We don't know when we can go back to school or go back to church or go back to our jobs or you know walk around the grocery store without a mask on. These seem like little things, but when they build up to school closures and business closures and making it illegal for people to interact with each other or invite your grandparents over, that takes a massive toll 
on the human psyche mm -hmm. and just how we interact with one another. And that has consequences outside of people feeling hopeless, feeling like they need to commit suicide. It actually changes the fabric of our society too. So I did another video on this that'll come out next month for Freedom Seeds, but I bet you didn't know 2020 saw the largest single year rise in homicide rates mm -hmm. in the United States than any other year. Yeah. And I think a lot of that has to do with we're viewing each other differently. Mm -hmm. We're means to an end, we're things to avoid first and foremost. And so we're pitting people against each other intentionally or not as enemies, as mm -hmm. something to fear, as something no longer to engage with and interact with and love unconditionally, which is what we're called to do as Christians and be involved in each other's lives. I am devastated by the result of this mental health crisis that I don't think anybody really saw coming. You know, everybody said, okay, sure, we'll stay home for a few weeks and then we'll just deal with it from there. But the lack of human interaction that we're experiencing mm -hmm. is changing our minds. It's changing how we interact with each other outside of our own minds. And then, of course, our society at large. As somebody who has lost a friend to suicide just before her 16th birthday, I know mm -hmm. just how much all of these parents and these families must be completely reeling yeah. from the consequences of these lockdowns. Yeah. And there's a very simple solution. Reopen society yeah. and let people make their own choices mm -hmm. on whether or not they want to expose themselves potentially to this virus, yeah. especially given vaccines are rolling out very quickly right now in our society. Most people who have been exposed to the virus have gotten it and now gotten over it. So they have some sort of immunity mm -hmm. to COVID-19. It's time at this point mm -hmm. to reopen society yeah. and get people back to work and back in school and interacting with each other. Unfortunately, I don't foresee that really happening on a national scale anytime mm -hmm. soon. And that's really unfortunate to see. Yeah. And that's why we encourage people, especially churches in Tucson, we we're not like California. Like we don't have like Charlie was just here and we had a cop car there and a, a police officer there who was there enjoying the service and he was just like there was no social distancing we were packed people were shaking hands and morgan i think someone morgan shook someone's hand and at first they kind of looked shocked so morgan thought oh no they're gonna be mad they're like this is amazing yeah. like, they're this like so our, our other churches our church that we go to yeah. doesn't let us do this and they were just like how sad is that yeah. it by is the way, that we've lost the ability to even just remotely mm -hmm. practice polite manners with exactly. each other we don't shake hands yeah. we don't hug we don't interact with each other anymore and it's just so so sad to me mm -hmm. because we are we're creatures of community mm -hmm. we need each other to survive we're not meant to be by ourselves and be isolated mm -hmm. and think that everyone else was somehow out to get you with some unforeseen virus yeah. <laughs> exactly we were watching the one there's a short clip with kevin james and he was like shaking this guy's hand at the park and then this person like takes a picture and then they're like running getting chased by all these people and i was laughing at it when it first came out but now i'm like it's, it's kind of yeah, serious it's like that's literally people will freak out and will come after you and so what we need to do is understand if we're not doing anything against what the word of god says and we do our best to write we're gonna respect we're not gonna just be like oh we're gonna just be so rude and not do anything. We're going to be wise. We're not going to be dumb. Like if we're not feeling good, we're not going to cough all over people and stuff. And if we need to do elbow bumps, we'll do that, you mm. know, if that's needed. But the whole point of it too is just like what Charlie was saying too, like liberty costs. Like there's like, there's constant, there's things that happen. Like the speed limit, people die. Like, I don't know what was the statistic of how many people die driving mm. yeah. like every year, but it was ridiculous. Like, like 50,000, 550,000. Oh, he's like, then yeah. we should just make the speed limit 15 miles an hour and like a carriage ride or like, um, but you know what? Like, that's the whole point is like, there's freedom. Like, and, and we also need to realize the reason why a lot of people freak out is because they are concerned what the future is going to look like because they don't know what eternity looks like. Like, they don't know. They're probably in their beds at night, right? And if you're out there afraid or scared saying, oh my goodness, like what's the meaning of life? Where am I going to go when I die? And the only encouragement I would say to you is, you know what? All you have to do is say, God, like speak to me, like and read your Bible. Open up your Bible. I love that Erica is doing the 365 day Bible plan and reading that. I encourage people to read your Bible and mm -hmm. to just go to church, get accountability, have that, like you were saying, community. We need each other. And you're not alone, like knowing that even though the world is getting worse and all this stuff is happening, that, you know, we're going to be with God in heaven one day. And that's our hope. Like as Christians, we have hope and we have the answer. So no matter what we go through here, we're not going to stop fighting. We're not going to start stop standing for truth until the day we die. But until then, like you said, we need to choose joy. We need to continue to share the truth 
in love. And so we're so thankful that you're doing that. But is there anything else that you would like to share with our listeners? Yeah, I think I I just also would love to touch on the fact that our removal of God from society has just proven to be so detrimental in every aspect of our culture. But this year in particular, it's really highlighted that most people's biggest fear is death. Mm -hmm. And that's all centering around COVID-19. The worst thing that could possibly happen is that you get sick and you happen to be one of the rare cases where thing turns really bad in, in the hospital, you're hooked up to a ventilator and then you die which doesn't happen for the vast, vast, vast majority of people who receive uh, exposure to this virus and obviously end up contracting the virus. But that's the fear that's Mm -hmm. driving all of these lockdowns, your inability to communicate with people and the completely different way that we're seeing each other in society and interacting together. Death is unfortunate and it's sad. And yeah, it's a little scary. Of course, we're all a little apprehensive, even if Mm -hmm. you believe you're going to a really wonderful place after this. Mm -hmm. It's a scary journey to walk through, but that is definitely not the worst thing that could ever happen, especially if you have a strong relationship with God and you know that this world is not your Mm -hmm. home. People are clinging so severely to staying here and being in the good graces of this world. And that goes back to the cultural conversation that we were having earlier that they're absolutely petrified to move forward past this pandemic. Mm -hmm. It's much easier to just stay inside your home. You don't need to feel that way. And that's a very Mm -hmm. debilitating level of fear to be living with every day. There's so much freedom in just accepting that things are going to work out the way that they're supposed to. Mm -hmm. And you have to have faith in something so much bigger than never getting sick again or, you know, staying inside your house forever as a means of protection, because that's not going to work either. I hate to break Mm -hmm. that to you. So Embrace the freedom that comes with having faith in something so much bigger than this world. That's God to me and to you guys. But for other people listening, maybe it's not. And maybe it's just understanding that there's something bigger out there. And that's a really good place to start. And there's just so much um, comfort in reading the Bible Mm -hmm. and engaging in that intentional time with God Mm -hmm. and not fixating so much on the insane headlines of our world today. Turn off the TV, turn off your phone every once in a while, mm-hmm. read your Bible, and I guarantee you, you're going to feel a lot better. Exactly. Amen. I love yeah, that. Yeah, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Amen. It's like if we're if we're on this earth, we're supposed to be doing, hopefully, what all of us are doing, which is speaking the truth and to just live life the way that God has designed it for us, you know? And I liked how you said earlier to have a purpose, and I think that adds to so much of this mental health crisis, mm-hmm. you know, because people they don't have a purpose and then when you're locked inside all day you know and and you can't see people's faces and you can't interact with people it's just you feel so disconnected you feel like you don't have a purpose so but there are ways to connect you know come to church Mm -hmm. or even things like this i know that it's not like it's not exactly face to face but just that encouragement and talking with like-minded people and, you know, because like you admitted, and we all, we can have anxiety, we can have um, depression at times, but that's why we need to communicate with one another and encourage each other as iron sharpens iron and we need to spur each other on to love and good deeds. So, yeah, I've, you've done that for us, I Amen. know. So you thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you, guys. So <laughs> last thing, can you tell people where they can find you, where they can follow you and pick up your book, Frontlines, which has already come out by the time this releases? So. Mm-hmm. Frontlines, Freedom Seeds, Gen Free, all that. Can you tell people where to find you? The best and easiest way to find me is on social media. And I know a lot of you have probably deactivated that. <laughs> it's time to get back in and join the culture war yeah. and help us impact our culture. I'm at the Isabel Brown on Instagram, Facebook, and Parlor, which is back live online, even if it's not on an app on your phone. And at the Isabel B on Twitter. The spelling is very easy. I S A B E L, and my last name is Brown, like the color. It's crazy to me that my book is going to be out by the time you guys listen to this, and I'm so excited that this journey is finally coming to fruition. You can buy it pretty much anywhere you can think of to buy a book. Uh, Amazon is probably the easiest place, especially if you have Prime shipping, because that is available to Prime users on Amazon, Mm. Barnes & Noble online, and tons of other retailers too. Uh, But I'm pretty sure that should cover most everybody listening to this. Mm. So I'm so, so grateful for all of your guys' support. And I'm just really hopeful that everybody feels a little bit more emboldened after they read this book to take on that active role in our culture today. Mm. And we'll have that in the description below. So we'll have that on Amazon. You guys can pick up her book and check out Freedom Seeds and... Isabel, again, thank you so much yeah, for joining us today. Awesome. Thanks for having me, guys. Hey, guys. Thanks so much for joining us on Calvary Conversations. If you haven't already, 
please make sure to like, subscribe, and share this video. If you would like to listen to us wherever you get your podcast, just type in Calvary Conversations. Also, make sure to follow us on Instagram at Calvary Conversations. Make sure to check out our new merch in the description below and praying that you have a blessed week.